All right, Romans chapter 15, verse 4 states this. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And then Job chapter 8, verse 8 through 10 states this. For inquire, I pray thee, of the former age, and prepare thyself to, to the search of their fathers. For we are but of yesterday, and know nothing, because our days upon earth are a shadow. Shall not they teach thee, and tell thee, and other words out of their heart? So I started with these verses because I have decided, well, I was actually debating if uh, I should do another Try the Spirits uh, series, but I realized that I still haven't finished the Try the Spirits, the Catholic volume. <laughs> so I was like, ah, I, I don't want to keep jumping from different Try the Spirits. And this one's not really Try the Spirits. This one's more of a history a lesson, a Christian history lesson. And I think it's important for us. Um, so I decided to uh, to uh, understand Christian history, true Christian history, not uh, Catholic history, which a lot of people believe is the universal first church. Um, but I started with these verses because I have decided to start another series called The Old Paths 101. So, yes, this is Sunday school and we're about to have a history school lesson. Right. Uh, this is inspired not by not only my love for the word of God, but my love for true history. And I stress that out, true history and uh, uh, biblical history um, and Christian history because the history we are taught is over, is usually overly simplified um, and or propagandized and or viewed in rose tinted glasses which can uh, mislead and deceive us away from the truth. As for myself, when I understand history, it points me right to the, uh, to, to the word of God. How? Because it proves that history is complex. Men are, men are sinners, yet complex, still sinners. And if you don't have God, we perish. Um, history with God's word as your foundation will help you discern properly the what, the how, and the why, and other essential meanings to historical events. Um, another thing I will add is that I hate that Christians have believed in lies and are ignorant to the truth, specifically in history. I have seen Christians wrongly glor uh, glorify ungodly men because they were taught wrongly and did not study to show thyself approved unto God. It is important to know true history and not fall for the lies because, in effect, when we know true history, it forms our mindsets in the way, which we either accept the truth or we either deny the truth. Um, and if we are willing to deny the truth about historical events and figures outside of the Bible, then are we not walking on the thin line of denying the Bible truth from history and wisdom? Case in point, many people believe that Martin Luther King Jr. was this godly man that was martyred for the crisis cause. They probably also think that the civil rights movement was a Christian movement too. However, the truth tells us this. I mean, really just look outside. Look at the state of the black community. After the civil rights movement, what happened? The crack cocaine epidemic, gang, gang violence, Increased significantly, single parent uh, households increased significantly, uh, black men incarcerated significantly. And so what, the civil rights movement was a good movement? The, I mean, the effect of it was a good movement. Martin Luther King, on the other hand, um, everybody will constantly quote the same quote. I mean, I swear, anytime people want to say Martin Luther King is a good Christian because he says, I have a dream. Yeah, he was dreaming. All right. But he had a dream about uh, I live to see a day where my children could walk hand in hand with a white, I don't even remember because I don't care about it. I, I don't, I, I'm not deceived by a quote, a good quote, not by enticing words by a man. Um, they, um, however, the truth tells us that the man, from his own words, from his own mouth, from his, and you can look this up on the internet, um, from his um, foundation, um, the truth tells us that this man, Martin Luther King, believed that Christ was just a man and not 100 percent God, not God at all. He just believed him that he was a man, as well as that the Bible is a book of myths. He stated that. But this is not our topic for today. Um, this is not our, our topic for today because or nor the civil rights is because I want to show you a part of history that is very overly simplified, very propagandized um, a lot. I'll also be touching on the figure that most people do glorify on this side of heaven. I will tell the story about a time in history where serious Christian persecution occurred no less than 160 years ago, right here on American soil, and where the light of the word of God was almost diminished right here 
on American soil. And I want this to be also, as we go through this part of history, this to also be a warning for Christians today who believe that, or now who, who, who believe that things are going to get worse. And I believe things are going to get worse. But this is a warning of what we, are, we should do, right? And to get our mind rights for the, as the world is waxing more and more wicked. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for another day. Um, Lord, just please be with me. Make sure I do not err from the truth. Open our minds, open our understandings, so that we may understand true history, as well as making sure that the history that we are going to learn today leads you right back to what you, who, who you are, that you are the way, the truth, and the life. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. So, though it may be controversial to say what I'm about to say, the truth is that the way many people view the American Civil War is wrong. I love, this is my favorite time of history. Um, but many people believe that the southern states were leading this rebellion uh, that would have somehow ended up taking over the whole United States and would have forced slavery all over, even into the free states. But this is not the truth. Far from the truth. Some folks call the Civil War the War of Northern Aggression, and that is a proper name for it. Uh, for it was Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, Honest Abe, who chose to go into Fort Sumter uh, in Virginia and do some unconstitutional acts such as suspending habeas corpus. Now, what is habeas corpus? Habeas corpus is a court order that commands an individual or a government official who has restrained another to produce a prisoner at a designated time and place so that the court can determine the legality of custody and decide whether to order the prisoner's release. However, Lincoln imprisoned whoever he viewed as traitors in his own eyes. And we're going to somewhat talk about that. Uh, but really, that's not my main point today. Today, I want to talk about how Lincoln allowed Christian persecutions and terror amongst Christians and innocent civilians across the American South. He sent out Sherman, right, um, uh, General Sherman, uh, who went total war in Atlanta, uh, Sheridan, Butler, and many others to execute total war upon the defenseless. He even used human shields long before Saddam Hussein used hostages around the missile and military sites. Uh, you, uh, I mean, you, if you look up uh, Morris Islands in uh, Charleston Harbor, you can uh, look at some uh, facts about that, but let's talk about a time where the Union Army actually desecrated churches, right? Desecrated churches. And I want to ask y'all this, especially those who thought this war was justified for whatever reason you think. As Christians, do you think the things that we're about to go over were justified? So, this is um, recorded in William Wallace's uh, Civil Wars Letters. Um, this was nothing more than wanton destructions and vandalism under the guise of war. It was other devastations and malicious thievery committed by ruthless men under orders from their high command as a way for them to vent their vile feelings of hate and contempt upon helpless civilians. Besides committing outright thievery and personal, from uh, personal residences, depleting the inventories of stories, uh, stores and abusing any southerner at will, their woeful disregard for sacred houses of worship and cemeteries was appalling even to some of their own soldiers, right? Re recorded in William Wallace's Civil War's letters, the Virginia campaign, right? So this is uh, a, a Union soldier who uh, witnessed this. Uh, he was a Union soldier actually um, a when he was at age of 31, from uh, the Wisconsin Regiment of uh, Banks Division. And he quotes this, after all was settled, the wagons were sent to Bolivar for our knapsacks. And in the meantime, we were quartered in the several churches through the town. It was blowing a perfect gale, cold and piercing. No poison will open the church we were sent to. The uh, major ordered two men to break open the door if the old preacher would not open it. In a few minutes, he gave up the key and we were in the church. At four in the evening, the wagons got back after night, and then we had to go out in the dark and search for our knapsacks, which was not an easy matter to find, but we got them, made our beds in the pews of the church, and it was a curious sight to see so many warlike men in it. The house of the living God, where his word has often been preached, I felt myself that I was committed a sacrilege, but it could not be avoided. The exigence of the time required it, for we could not lay out. The aisles and the pews were well carpeted, but they were not long that, co uh, that collar with the, mu the mud and tobacco spit. At this moment, it was 
it, at this moment, it is ridiculous to look at. But the boys say it is owned by rebels and it is no harm. They hardly ever stop playing the organ while others is playing cards and playing the fiddle and dancing, swearing all around. This war will ruin many a soul. It is handing uh, it over to Satan each day. Some of the companies had their tent, has their tents in the cemetery with the heads of the living against the headstones of the dead. The tombstone serves for the tables to eat off and at the same time blaspheming the name of the Redeemer, not thinking how soon they may be, they may be in the land of forgetfulness. Typical of the Union Army under the command of Sheridan and the uh, Sh uh, Shen Shenandoah uh, where were widespread, widespread reports of pillaging and looting, which uh, Sheridan referred to as foraging. Uh, in Sheridan, the life and wars of General Phil Sheridan, um, he recounts the following incidents. But the crowning blow came when Wilson showed Sheridan a dispatch for a meed uh, demanding that Wilson defend himself from, from sensational charges made by the uh, Richmond newspaper that Union Cavalry had broken two churches and homes during the raid and that Wilson himself, a highwayman, a wine bibber, and a modern, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this word, had encouraged such looting. Darn, darn him, Sheridan said of Meade, give him heck. Um, and it's harsher words, right? Uh, more vulgar words. Uh, let's look at more stories. A horse in the church, right? A solitary Union scout, Corporal James Pike of the 4th uh, Ohio Cavalry, was already most favorably known to his superior officers by his scouting services when early in April 1862, he was dispatched by General Mitchell to Decatur, Alabama, to gather information regarding the strength of the enemy and, if possible, to destroy the railroad bridge at that point. He went alone and he would thus be liable to less suspicion and would be better able to escape if pursued than if accompanied by a small force, while a large one was, of course, out of a question. And I quote, he came to a small country church. It was Sunday, and the congregation was devoutly listening to the sermon. But in that congregation, there might be Confederate soldiers, determined, like a prudent general, to leave no enemies in his rears, and yet knowing that it might be dangerous to dismount in order to investigate, he spurred his horse up the two or three steps that the floor of the building was raised above the ground, right into the middle of the only aisle. As the horse's hooves struck loudly upon the floor, the congregation started from its altitude, uh, attitude of rapt attention. The pre uh, preacher, whose hand was raised and in the act of coming down with a thump upon the pulpit, paused in the sermon and the gesture to look at the singular spec uh, spec spectacle of an armed horseman in the church. Sorry to interrupt you, sir, he said, addressing the preacher. Are there any southern soldiers in the church? I, I believe not, sir, replied the star of the divine, turning his eyes instinctively to the back door, which stood open. Suspecting that there had been southern soldiers in the building a few moments ago, and that back door had been their means of exit, he directed the preacher to offer a prayer for the president of the United States, backed his horse out of the building, and rolled on, realizing that a rapid movement was his only safety from an aroused country, uh, county, uh, country, and saw that he had already disturbed the worshipers only too completely. That's from Deeds of Daring uh, by both Blue and Gray by uh, D.M. Uh, Kelsley. Um, let's see. Here's another one. Uh, a similar fate awaited the Associated Reformed Church of Fairfield County in 1865 at the defiled hands of General uh, Kilpatrick's Union Church, uh, Calvary. Ebenezer Church, as it was often called, was erected in 1788 uh, by the people of the Lower Little River section of the county. They were predominantly Scot-Irish, Scott uh, highly religious, and staunch and fervent in their belief. Uh, near the church, there were skirmishes with the Confederates who had the advantage of being located on the ridge. When the cavalry reached Little River, they found that the Confederates had burned the bridge. In order to avoid the bullets of the sharpshooters in the hills above them, the Yankees took advantage of their little church and ripped out part of the flooring and woodwork to hastily construct the bridge over which they might cross the swollen stream and move on beyond the ridge. After they left, a note of apology was found inscribed on some of the woodwork that remained intact, and it read thus, 
to the citizen of this county, please excuse us for defacing the ho your house of worship. It was completely necessary to effect a crossing over the creek, signed a Yankee. Now, occasionally, Union soldiers would show some respect by a small act of kindness. In Boone County, uh, Missouri soldiers first removed the church's Bible and set it on a stump outside before reducing, it, reducing the church houses to ashes. The Little River Baptist Church, which was erected in 1845, also suffered damage to a lesser degree. Uh, the imported prisms of the chandeliers were smashed, though, some of the furnishings abused, and the building left in a general mess, as recorded in a Fairfield uh, sketchbook by Ju Julian S. Uh, Bolick, which was in the South Car uh, Camden, South Carolina uh, archives. Mm. Um, we also have some pictures I'll, I'll probably show you just after church, but um, the uh, Massaponex Church in Virginia, and, and talk about Virginia, um, Sister Monique's old stumping grounds uh, was used as General Grant's temporary field uh, headquarters. At Grant's orders, the pews were removed uh, outside the church so they could be used in an open air council of war. Oh. Uh, Union General U.S. Grant and his staff holding their, yeah, so, yeah, pretty much they took, pretty much imagine them just taking all these chairs by force, and they made this house of God, house of worship, house of prayer, into a house of war, a war room, right? All right. Here's another one. In order to keep warm, federal troops dismantled every building in sight to be used as firewoods in the town uh, of Miraville, South Carolina. Sergeant Flaherty watched as the village church was attacked. First, the pulpit and seats were torn out. Then the sidings of the blinds were ripped off. Many axes were at work. The corner posts were cut. The buildings tottered. The beautiful spire up among the green trees leaned, vibrated to and fro. A tree that stood in the way was cut, but the use of long poles, the men increased the vibra vibratory motion of the building, and soon, with a screeching groan, the spire sunk down. And as the structure became a pile of rubbish, some of the most wicked of the raiders yelled out, there goes your darn old gospel shop, Sherman's March. After the Battle of Aiken, South Carolina, uh, Aiken, South Carolina, a squad of Confederate General Willard Scouts found an old man leaning upon a gate post, sobbing in front of a farmhouse. After an inquiry, the old man, a local Baptist minister, told the scouts in a trembling voice, my daughter, a bunch of Yankees raped her. They just left her. According to um, historian uh, Bill Potter of Charles uh, City, Virginia, uh, 1862, federal troops operating out of Williamsburg, Virginia, dismantled Liberty Baptist Church in New Kent County to build a bridge across uh, this, uh, this kind of creek. No battles were found nearby and no armies were on the move. The area was even undefended at that time. After the war, the surviving church members pulled the bridge apart and reconstructed their church building. The only type of reconstruction tolerated in that place for many, many years. If war was to set right here on American soil again, and recently we've been having a lot of, um, what do you call it, madness, uh, unrest, that's what they like to call it. What well, preachers allow their church to be used as a council of war because their favorite politician says so, right? Would, would preachers, uh, or, or would you stand on the solid rock and not allow your house of God, the house of God, to be turned into a house of earthly warfare? Yes, we're supposed to have spiritual warfare, but why so often does the house of God, and I'm talking, I'll speak for the so-called black churches, they become a political soapbox, a soap opera, I'll call it, right? Political theater for, for uh, instead of a house of prayer, right? Um, too often, right? Um, now, we're gonna to go to the next section. I have no problems talking about the incarcerated preachers like uh, preacher uh, Reverend Richard N. Hernan, who, uh, who, who died in prison in uh, actually Culpeper County, Virginia. And if you know what about Culpeper County, Virginia, do you know about Culpeper County, Virginia? 
So the history, actually, of Culpeper County, I believe, is the same place where you know who James Ireland is. Yeah, that's it's the same place where a lot where he was jailed at, where he built his church at, and a lot of his ministry was at. So the same preacher, um, just again, the same place where James Ireland was prisoner at. Um, but I, I, I could talk about Richard N. Herndon if you want to do your own personal research, who who died in prison in Culpeper County, uh, Virginia. But I, I want to talk about the things that the well beloved and idolized Abraham Lincoln uh, made a contraband of war. All right. And again, I already know this is going to be controversial because I know we as a society do idolize things. I mean, look, actually, one of the uh, the pictures. Of, of the desecrated churches um, was actually one of the first churches. I, I can't remember what church, and I don't feel like looking through it because that's a lot of searching, but one of the churches um, was the first church to build their church uh, similar to the uh, Greek, uh, Greek inspired with the pillars and all that stuff. And if you know about American history, um, the Greeks and the Romans inspired a lot of the architecture and, and uh, the laws too, um, but the Greeks and the Romans inspired a lot. Um, wow, I, I can't remember why I'm going to this point, but oh, but Abraham Lincoln, right? You go to the temple or whatever, the, the memorial Abraham Lincoln, well, if you just compare that to the, the picture of uh, the temple of Zeus, it's pretty much the same one and the same, right? The Temple of Abraham Lincoln and the Temple of Zeus. But, but we, we, we do have this bad habit in, in, as Americans and just as societies making not only memorial. It's one thing when you do memorial statues, memorials, but there's another thing when you just do these grand gestures that for me, I'm, I, why? This person's not God. Why, you are, why are you doing things that the pagans right? The heathens used to do, right? Uh, but anyway, honest Abe Lincoln, what did he make a, contra uh, a contraband of war? He made medicine a contraband of war. Why, uh, certain medicines, right? Why did he make medicine a contraband of war if he was such a compassionate humanitarian, right? Uh, not only did he war against the weak and the defenses, but as we see from, uh, you know, from Sherman's bummers and just a lot of the acts, the generals uh, even committing total war, and again, Lincoln didn't <laughs> disapprove, saying, ah, oh, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that without my, they allowed, he allowed it to happen. Um, but not only did he war against the weak and the defenses, but he warned against the souls, the souls of the people of the South. Did you know that Abraham Lincoln made the Holy Bible a contraband of war? Right? He made the Bible a contraband of war, and we're going to talk about it. Jesus, uh, Jesus, the Lord Christ said this, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against man. For ye, for ye never go, neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Matthew chapter 23, verse 13. He's trying to, who, who does that? What Christian man, self-proclaimed Christian, I don't care, will tell people you can't own the Bible. We're going to make the Bible a contraband of war. You can't deliver Bibles across enemy lines, right? It kind of, it's just kind of weird, right? And I know people who, and, and again, when you do further history, you'll reveal more things about who Abraham Lincoln, the man, was. But that's neither here or there. Um, consider how one of the Confederate soldiers considered this act. Of uh, the Bible being a contraband of war. Again, this is some stuff that they are not going to teach you. They're not going to teach you. Same thing that why they're not going to teach you true Christian history about the Novitists and the Donatists and all them. They're not going to teach you about this, this moment in history. They'll teach you about the first great awakening. Hey, they might teach you about the second great awakening, even though you had to do a little bit more research on those things. But there was an awakening right here in the Confederate Army. Again, consider this. Why, after the Civil War specifically, the South is still considered the Bible Belt, right? One of the uh, Confederate soldiers considered this act of, of the Bible being the contraband of war. And I'll quote, I am a poor sinner and have no chance to be any other way, for I have no Bible. Yankees want us to lose our souls, same as our lives. It is an, ag it is an aggravation for breakfast, dinner, and supper. You heard about history before. 
you heard about this history before. Or is it uh, that we are taught or indoctrinated to believe that Abraham Lincoln and the whole Civil War was some type of Christian music similar to the Civil Rights Movement and Martin Luther King and all them uh, cats? However, another part of history that doesn't get taught enough about is the revival that was happening in the Confederate Army and the Christian mobilization that occurred despite the Bible being banned, being uh, a contraband of war. And, but, and, and despite the Bible being a contraband of war, Christians decided to mobilize, and this did cause a great awakening in the Confederate Army. Because guess what? When the Confederates won their first battle, oh, they, it, it was pretty much they, they were in a house of, uh, what do you call it, mirth. Getting, they had a reputation of getting drunk. Having a, had a, I'm talking about the Confederates. They had a reputation of getting drunk. Having a rep, pretty much the stereotypical military, right? drunkenness, cursing, and all this other stuff, right? Especially when they won their first battle, but when they lost, whoosh, humbled. They got humbled real quick. And then when these acts, right, uh, from especially the uh, uh, contraband of war, a lot of stuff really was bringing down the morale of the Confederate Army. Um, check this out. This is from uh, Christ and Kemp, or Religions in Lee's Army by Reverend John William Jones. Very good book. Long book, I'll say. A small print. Huh? John, uh, Christ and Kemp, In the Kemp, or Religion in Lee's Army by John William Jones. Right. And it's a great book. Um, it it's really is a... It talks a lot about uh, the culprits, the, the preachers that were sent out into the Confederate armies all throughout the South, and the, the work that these Christian godly men did um, and they, in, just in a troubled time, a troubling time, and just how the gov even the government, from Jefferson David, uh, Davis to uh, Stonewall Jackson and Robert E. Lee, um, and, and even um, but the world's history has never been never presented a wider and this is from chapter five bible and corporate work the world's history has never presented a wider field of usefulness to the humble corporate who tries to do his duty than the camps and hospitals of the confederate armies and rarely have christian workers more fully improved their golden opportunities when the war broke out nearly all the great publishing houses were located at the north our people generally did their bible and tract work in connections with societies whose headquarters were in northern cities and our facilities for publishing were very scant. The great societies at the north generally declared Bibles and Testaments contraband the war and we had at once to face the problem of securing supplies through the blockade or manufacturing them with our poor facilities. So the south they just didn't have good they were really becoming more worn toward they didn't have the proper facilities and again Literally, the first Confederate Bible printed, so far as I can ascertain, was from the presses of the Southwestern Publishing House at Nashville, Tennessee, 1861. Uh, a copy of this edition was sent to President uh, Jefferson Davis, who replied, The Bible is a beautiful specimen of Southern workmanship. And if I live to be inaugurated the first president of the Confederacy on the 22nd of February, my lips shall press the sacred volume which your kindness has bestowed upon me. Hey, Amen. How, how many presidents? Have we heard glory, uplift the word of God like that? Has Trump did it? Has Biden did it? Has Obama did it? Right? Ha, has Joe, George H. W. Right? We go that Bill Clinton. We already know what he. We know what he glorifies, right? But you don't see this in America. Our leaders. Well, we we see them being men pleasers. Right? We'll see them at church. Oh, yeah, yo, I love the Bible, but then they'll be in the Buddhist temple. Oh, yeah, I love Buddha, you know, bowing down to the fat Buddha, right? They'll, they'll, they'll do they'll, they'll, pretty much what Herod and Pilate, all, all of them did. They just did whatever pleases the people so they can get in power and stay in power, right? And that's why people believe all roads lead to heaven, right? Um, the British and Foreign Bible Society gave to the Confederate Bible Society unlimited credit in the purchase of supplies and made liberal donations of the Bibles and Testaments for our soldiers. As the following statements of Dr. Bennett will show, 
Finding that for the main supply, they must rely on importations from abroad. The Confederate Bible Society's directed its correspondent secretary, Reverend Dr. E. H. Myers, to communicate with the British and foreign Bible societies with the view of securing such occasional supplies as might be lucky enough to escape the dangers of the blockade and reach our ports. Dr. Myers, after detailing the operation of the society, said this. The proposition is simply that we be allowed a, uh, a credit with your society for the scriptures we need. Say to the value of a thousand credits, uh, pounds I think, um, until such time as sterling uh, exchange is reduced to about its usual cost. We pay interest on our purchase until the debt is liquidated. They went into debt so they could print out the Bibles. That, you see that happening today? No, not at all. Right, early in the war, Bibles and Testaments were easier to bring in, of course, but there were reasons that the shortage developed as the war lingered. First, many copies of the Bibles, uh, many copies of the Bibles, uh, scriptures being imported from England through the British and foreign Bible societies, which gave the Confederate Bible Society uh, limited credits, were captures in the attempts to run the blockades. The cap these captures Bible captured Bibles were then sc uh, scattered through the North as souvenirs, right? Um, again, uh, same book, Christ and Count, page 150. Um, and actually, you can, you can look this up on Google Books, free books on Google Books. So again, there's no excuses about, oh, I, I ain't got enough money for a, a, all throughout college. I, I found a way to find textbooks on PDFs. You heard me? So, uh, but anyway, so page 50. Um, Let's see, the visit of Reverend Dr. Moses D. Hodges of Richmond uh, to England was not only very useful in securing the large donations of Bibles and Testaments noted above, but his eloquent statement of the religious work in the Confederate armies in which he was so able and efficient a helper elicited the sympathies and prayers of many Christians in Great Britain. He brought over also many very valuable books and tracts, uh, some of which were republished for use in our armies. One of my most cherished mementos of the war is a portable Bible, commentary and coordinates, which were brought over by Dr. Hodges, and copies of which were presented to many other chaplains by the accomplishment, accomplished Christian woman and noble workers, Mrs. E. H. Brown, of the, uh, uh, wow, who was appropriately called the chaplain's friend, and whose untiring labors in the hospitals won her the warm love of the soldiers, and doubtless many stars in the crowning of rejoicing she now wears. Unfortunately, however, only a part of the Bibles and other supplies secured by Dr. Hodges succeeded in running the blockade, and many copies of the Word of God intended for our suffering soldiers were captured and scattered through the North as souvenirs, right? So, bam. The, the pressure exerted by the, uh, the, the federal government's unholy crusade against the souls of the Southern people hold dear, um, as, as, as a result of the steadily tightening naval blockade, it is said Southern, Southerners had even been denied the privilege of importing, importing the Word of God brought into the Bible, in, in the Bible house. Thus, the South had no option, and this is from Gibson's Stories of the American Bible Society. Um, thus, the South had no options but to look to her own resources for the Book of Life. Um, secondly, Right. The second reason why uh, the shortage developed was the South before the war had depended on publishers in the North for Bibles. But when these sources eventually ended, obviously the South needed to produce Bibles. And as I we John uh, Williams talked about, the Southwestern Publishing House in Nashville, Tennessee, began to print the first Confederate Bibles. Um, however, due to the limitations posed by a single publisher. Right. Uh, again, one publishing company for how many states in the South? That's hard, especially with limited resources. That is just very hard. You, you're only limited, so limited. Um, which developed uh, because of the war, there were still never enough Bibles. Third, the greatest of the obstacles to bringing in enough Bibles had to be Abraham Lincoln's policy of making God's word contraband of war. The American Bible Society agreed to supply Bibles, and the American Bible Society, I believe, they're located in the north. But what they did, what they did was very, very, it was beautiful. They really risked their lives to deliver the Bible. Again, I ask you, are we willing to do that if things start to go down the game? 
Are we willing to do that? Will you, do you, can you just imagine? I, I can't imagine it, really. You never know. We'll have to, we, we do have some few good men, right? Um, but uh, the, the American Bible Society agreed to supply Bibles to the south of May of 1861. What followed is an example of how Bible bound for the south were considered. And I'll quote the first books, and this is from um, the Sentinel, uh, Sentinel History of the American Bible Society by Henry Otis Dwight. Um, page 262. Um, I, I have all these books, so if you want to borrow, <laughs> I, I'm a nerd, man. I, I, I'm, I'm a geek. Uh, but I do have all these books. Um, I just didn't bring all of them because it'll, it'll be in, <laughs> we'll, we'll be here until it'll be a five-hour lecture, right? Um, but the uh, but yeah, the Sentin uh, Sentinel History of the American Bible Society by Henry Otis Dwight, um, and he and it quotes this: The first books sent in the West were held up as contraband of war. Early in the 1862, uh, federal officers at Cairo, Illinois, stopped a parcel of New Testaments uh, as contraband, which was addressed to General Bishop uh, Leonidas Polk's army at Columbus, uh, Kentucky. Right, so. Bam, the, the blockade, right? Um, but the ABS, uh, the American Bible Society, so the ABS did not give up on their purpose of the society. And that purpose was the publishing and spreading of the word of God. Amen. The organizations tried uh, to help their southern brothers as best as they could. Yes, the American Bible Society's board of managers, and I'll quote from Gibson's book, uh, kept up the search for means of getting its scriptures uh, over over the high wall of war. The sending of Bibles uh, into the South under such circumstances was spoken at, of as a truce of God. The ABS claimed that more than 30,000 volumes were sent from their dis, uh, depository by purchase and donations to the Virginia Bible Society through the Maryland uh, Bible Society, or Merlin, right, as they say it. One North Carolina uh, pastor sought our governor, Zebulon B. Vance's help and contacting the ABS, let me say that again, one North Carolina pastor sought our out governor Zebulon B. Vance's help in contacting the ABS for copies of God's word for soldiers and citizens in his state. He declared that Bible property, the governor, he declared that Bible property was so extreme in his state that it will make the hearts of Christians ache. Do you think today's politicians will fight this hard if the Bible will have been a contraband of war today? A governor, right? Maybe. Hey, we don't know, right? We won't know until it happens, right? But the way things are happening, the things that we see in people, the way people have uh, been acting, I don't know. But I don't, the reason why I'm teaching this again is just to charge y'all up, to look at history and really learn and think about, hmm, okay, if they could do it, if our fathers can do it, we can do it too. Fourthly, according to Pitts, uh, Chaplains and Gray, the Tennessee Baptist uh, paper reported the good news of the Southwestern publishing venture stating Lincoln no longer binds the word of God. However, this was only a band-aid solution when considered in the light of great demand from the Confederate army and so southern so citizens for bibles chaplains and corporators often said that the demand was never satisfied right the fact that the people are asking for bibles begging for bibles and we're going to see some examples right here right now right camp near petersburg uh petersburg on uh, november 10th um and this is uh james uh, william jones written by him there is a great general demand in the army for small bibles i have daily applications from soldiers so eager to get them that they frequently say that say they will give several months wages for one but the supply at all of the dispositories and bookstores had long since been exhausted and there seems little prospect of a replenishment our brave boys must beg in vain for bibles they must beg in vain for bibles unless the good people at home at home who have hitherto contributed so liberally to the spiritual and temporal welfare of the army will also come to the rescue in this matter so he's calling people in the homes if you have a bible to donate please let let these soldiers <laughs> that that need god in this fight um please lend one a lady 
Uh, almost every family might buy a little sacrifice, spare one or small Bibles. A lady sent me the other day a Bible owned by her nephew, a noble Christian soldier, who carried it in nine battles and had it in his pocket when he fell at Sharpsburg. Right? One thing I talked about us being Christian soldiers, I always ask. I, mean, I remember I, I asked um, Rosie, I asked my little cousins, I asked the boys in Sunday school, I said, do you carry your Bibles? Do you carry your sword at all times? Do you consider this truly to be a weapon? When you go out to the world, is it with you at all times? Right? We will we'll carry our guns for the Second Amendment right, right? But we got this weapon. Our God-given weapon, right? So, again... A lady sent me the other day a Bible owned by her nephew, a noble Christian soldier who carried it in nine battles and it had, and had it in his pocket when he fell at Sharpsburg. It was, to, uh, it was to her a precious relic, and yet she was willing to give it up, that its glorious light might illumine the pathway of some other soldiers. Right? That's, that's deep, right? Like, th this is something my nephew owns this, right? Some people, they'll put that in the museum right, before they give it to anybody else. Oh, she said, no, y'all need it. Here you go. Here's the light, <laughs> right? Here's the light of God, right? I, I have given it to a gallant fellow who says that he has been trying for 12 months to procure a Bible. Are there not others who will and can aid in this way, right? Oh, man, that just, that got me excited, right? That people are these, these again, who we demonize today. We demonize Confederates today. But here, we get a view that they wanted Bibles in the season of war. They wanted Bibles. They're begging for Bibles, right? I have an old memorandum book filled, still uh, John William Jones. I have an old memorandum book filled with names of soldiers from every state of the Confederacy who had applied to me for Bibles and Testaments. And some of the scenes I witnessed in my work of Bibles and tract distribution are as fresh in my memory as if they had occurred on yesterday. I had, I had a pair of large shadow bags, which I used to pack with tracts and religious newspapers and with Bibles and Testaments when I had them. And besides this, I would, <clears throat> I would strap packages behind my saddle and on the pommel. Thus equipped, I was uh, sadly forth and as I drew near the camp, someone will raise the cry, yonder comes, yonder comes, the Bible and track man, right? Wouldn't that be cool to be considered, hey, yo, the Bible lady coming, <laughs> the track lady coming, especially if we start so, when we so win over here, hey, yo, yonder, oh, people don't say yonder, <laughs> right? But, hey, yo, <laughs> hey, look out there, the track people coming again from Solid Rock, the track people coming again, right? That, that, that'd just be so crazy. That'd be so cool. Um, but so he says, yonder comes the Bible and trap man, and such crowds will rush out to meet me that frequently I would sit on my horse and distribute my supplies before I could even get into the camp. But if I had Bibles or Testaments to distribute, the poor fellows will crowd around and beg for them as earnestly as if they were golden uh, guineas for free distribution. Yes, the word of God seemed to have these brave men more precious than wor uh, more precious than gold, yea, than much fine gold. The men were accustomed to form reading clubs, not to read the light literature of the day, but to read God's word. And not unfrequently have I seen groups of 25 or 30 gather around some good reader who for several hours will read with clear voices selected portions of the scriptures. Amen. Oh, that's just, whew. I, I just love that. All right. Uh, let's, let's go to more accounts, right? Uh, Reverend A.E. Dickerson, uh, the general superintendent of this board, gives the, um, the, the, the following incidents illustrating the feelings of our people. Uh, General Association of Virginia, right? That, that's um, the feeling of our people generally to, at the beginning of this work. When in Augusta, Georgia, some months ago, I made a public appeal in behalf of soldiers then in Virginia after the service was were concluded, a bright and beautiful little girl of four summers came up with a dime and said, tell my brother Johnny Howdy and buy him some good little tracks uh, with this. She thought, of course, everybody knew her brother and that there would not be any difficulty in finding him, right? The innocence of a child is cute. Uh, but uh, with a glad heart, she went away smiling at the thought that she had given her all. The next morning, an old Negro man came through the drenching rain to my place of abode and made the following remark. 
my heart was so sorry when I heard you tell of them poor soldiers in Virginia how they starving for the gospel and how to think that here I had to preach word all the time and there they is fighting for me. My heart is monstrous afflicted when I think of my young master out in the army and I want to send him the gospel. Hmm. Again, I think that just kind of blows a little hole in certain certain things about slavery, the American South, American history. It just starts to, you start to read actual first accounts of people who were actually there. You start to see, oh, wow, this kind of shows something different instead of roots that plagiarize fictional story, right? Anyway, it bothers me because people get their history from movies. They don't, they don't want to read books. They don't want to read first accounts of Europe. They, they want to read, they want to watch Django Unchained to learn about slavery. They want to watch Roots, right? Roots, right? right? They, they want to watch Roots. Again, another fictional story. Or uh, what, 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 uh, what movie did my uh, history teacher in college make me watch? Hidden Colors, uh, that, that terrible, where that, that pretty much is probably the beginning where you might step into either Pan-Africanism or uh, becoming the black Hebrew, right? Where everybody's black. Buddha, you see that, that black statue of Buddha? That's the so-called black man, because Buddha, Fa, in Chinese means black, Dr. Umar Johnson, right? God bless his soul. <laughs> Help him. <laughs> Help him deeply. But um, it was, I, I think it was like saving Uncle Tom's cabin. It, it's something like that. And it, it, it's actually a banned movie. And she made us watch it. And it was just gr- fictional movie about the Atlantic slave trade. I, I can't remember it. When I remember it, I, I'll let y'all know. But we, we learned history about slavery, history about the Civil War, history about the antebellum self. And I'm not saying that there were no atrocities that happened, no cruelties that happened. Again, it, it, we were human. This is a wicked world. Ain't nobody saying that. I'm not saying that. But I'm telling you that this, this, this rose-tinted view of the North came down to the South to free all the all the black people, all the slaves, it's, it's, it's like this much. It's like this much. All right, let me keep reading. The demand for the scriptures and tracts continue to be as great, if not greater, than at any former period. Oh, my bad. Uh, hey. Praise God. How you doing, Brother Jerry? How you doing, man? Are you preaching to yourself? Yeah, right now I'm preaching to myself. Preaching to God. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> um, but to continue. So saying, he placed a gold dollar in my hand and expressed his regret that it was so little, talk about the slaves, several persons gave large sums. But of all the hundreds, uh, hundreds thrown into the treasury, it seemed to me that this little girl and this gray-haired African uh, were the most liberal. They gave of their poverty. God grants that Brother Johnny and that young Massa may become savingly interested in the great salvation, A.E. Dickerson's. A question I ask is this, is, is the word of God precious to us today? If we were to face persecutions, will we go out of our ways to get a Bible, right? Just to get, get a Bible, to hold the Bible in our hands. If they, were say, if they were to say the Bible is banned, you can't own Bibles. And if, you, if we catch you sending Bibles, we're going to jail you. We're going to take those Bibles away. Are we willing to risk our lives for this thing here, for this this, this golden lamp, right, that, that lights our paths. Um, many of the, the homes in the South were depleted of their Bibles in order to try to quench the thirst for the water of life in the Confederate Army. The moving of God, but the, uh, the moving of God, the Holy Spirit in the awakenings in the armies of the Confederacy added to the need for Bibles. It seems like one of them good problems, right? It seemed like one of those good problems. 
Many soldiers in the army went from drunkards and blasphemers to newborn babes in Christ that hungered for the milk of the word of God. And the older believers hungered for the meats of the word. Um, and I quote um, from Pitts, chaplains in gray, a truce of God was a welcome arrangement to the Confederate States of America. God's sacred word did not pose a hazard to the minds of Southern people. Again, this puts Lincoln's treatment of God's holy and divine word as a contraband uh, in an even darker light. It just puts it in an even darker light for someone to do that on American soil. Come on, man. But Lincoln also, through his army, destroyed and desecrated the houses of God throughout the Confederacy. When the Reverend G.S. Uh, Griffin, an agent for the uh, American Bible Society, visited the Shenandoah Valley, just after conf uh, conflict ended, he was overwhelmed by the devastation to church buildings. How would you feel? Every Baptist church that we, we go by, it's just destroyed. People just destroy it. And the government don't care. I guarantee you, if it happens today, I don't, I don't know. They, they, they're already trying to tell people you can't come to church because, you know, trying to be safe or whatever for um, the, the, the pandemic, for the cookies, right? If the riots were to break that break out of the game, and they destroy the old solid Rock Baptist Church, Liberty, wherever you, whatever church, I don't think they care. They'll just be like, huh, "There goes your old gospel shop," <laughs> right? Um, so, um, when uh, yeah, so he had so going back to Reverend uh, G. S. Griffin, the agent from the American Bible Society, uh, he had been sent to ascertain how the American Bible Society could help. What he saw appalled him. Many other churches had been completely demolished. Many others were in such damaged conditions that they were, and I quote, unfit for divine service. In their great poverty, the residents of their communities were not able to do much towards making them serviceable. All right. Just a worn, torn uh, society. Uh, American Bible uh, Society agent Reverend W.P. Ratcliffe was, was in southern Arkansas just after the conflict. Um, he was trying to raise money for Bibles. Ratcliffe uh, related an event that moved him. A fatherless child showed up at the depository the next day. This was after a meeting Ratcliffe had conducted to raise awareness of the need for financing the purchase of Bibles. He said that the father's child in her hand, she clutched a pair of new of newly knitted socks. Mother was at the, the last uh, meeting last night, she told the minister, uh, and she hasn't and she hasn't any money. She sent these. It is all she had to send the Bible to the poor. Right. So again, they, they just send it where they can. <laughs> I, I ain't silver and gold. I ain't got nothing, but I got this pen. This pen is worth something. I, let that be used as contribution to um, purchasing the Bible. Thankfully, oh, uh, actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thankfully, many tracts and Bibles were still able to get across the lines and into the hands of soldiers and civilians of the Confederate Army. And the amazing thing that the Word of God can do when someone gets their hands on it. And it's especially during the time of war, well, let, let's actually just look at the effects that happened in the uh, uh, American, uh, uh, the Confederate Army. So going back to James, uh, uh, John Williams, Elder J.A. Dahl writes this, uh, Scottsville, October 2nd. We have a gracious revival here going on among the soldiers and citizens. One service is held during the day in one of our good hospitals and another at night in the church. A goodly number of soldiers and citizens have already professed conversions and the prospect is cheering. A private letter from a soldier who was in the Maryland campaign published in the Southwestern Baptist says, I had my Bible in my right breast pocket and a ball struck it and bounced back. It will have made a severe wound, but for the Bible, right? Now, that's one of those stories that you say, Lord, where the miracles at, right? But again, the fact that they're holding, I mean, they're holding the Bibles with them when they're going out on the field of war. That's, for me, that just blows my mind, right? Um, I, I would like to think that I would be able to do that, right? I, I would like to think I was, if I was a soldier, I would be able to do that, carry my Bible with me right here on my left side, on my left chest, because that's where my heart is, right? Uh, Brother H. Madison writes this. I have seen much of, 
I have seen much of the goodness of God since coming to the army. Many a warm thanks I received from the soldier. Oh, it is sad and yet glorious, a glorious thing to see a, so, a Christian soldier. They are so happy, so powerfully sustained of the Lord as far from home. They go through the dark, dark valley. I might tell you the particulars of two such cases. First, Reverend M.D. Anderson. Um, M.D. Anderson. I met with a young man some time ago who said to me, Parson, you gave me a book. Um, talk about the track that was labeled Baxter's Call. And you can actually look at these tracks, right? Baxter's Call. B-A-X-T-E-R apostrophe S Call. Which I have been reading and it had made, has made me very unhappy. I feel that my condition is just awful and desire to find peace. I pointed him to, uh, to the Lord Jesus. His regiment was ordered off, and therefore I have not seen him of late, but have written to him. While in the house, hospital with my tracks, one poor afflicted soldier went piteously and said, Sir, I cannot read. Will you be good enough to read some of those tracks to me? I read several, and among them, a mother's parting words to her soldier boy. That's a very good track to read, a mother's uh, parting, parting words to her soldier boy. You can go ahead and look that up if if you're interested, it's a very, very good, heartfelt, a uh, heartfelt uh, tract. O said he that reminds me so much of my poor old mother, who has faded from earth since I joined the army. He wept and seemed greatly affected. The second example, Reverend J. B. Actually, is a bunch of Reverend J. B. Uh, Hardwick. Hardwick. God is blessing the distribution of tracts and the labors of chaplains and carpenters here in Petersburg. More than 100 soldiers have been converted since April. I never knew a work of grace so powerful, quiet, and deep. It seems at times that the hospital is a Bethel, but we need more assistance. I call for reinforcements, and you must furnish them immediately if possible. Send us at least two carpenters, one for the hospitals and the other for the camps. Reverend J.C. Hyden. Can't you send us carpenters here uh, in Charlottesville? There is a most encouraging state of things at present. I am holding a, pro, uh, a protracted meeting. Uh, crowds attended the preaching, and some have professed a change of heart. While others are interested, it is an interesting sight to see men wounded in every variety of ways, sitting attentively to the story of the cross. Reverend T.J. McVeigh, chaplain at Farmville, my supply of tracts has been distributed, and the soldiers asked for more. I administered the ordinances of baptism for the first time a few Sabbaths since in the Adamox uh, River, to a young soldier from Alabama. It was the most deeply interesting and young and beautiful scene I ever witnessed. All the sol all of the soldiers who were able to leave their rooms gathered upon the banks of the river and seemed to have a high appreciation of the ordinances. Right? So they're doing public um they're doing baptism, right? Right there in the river. Reverend William Huff Marion uh, uh, from Marion, Virginia. Uh, our corporators now in the Western Army are laboring um, with encouraging prospects. Reverend J.H. Harris is visiting General Marshall's command. He finds them destitute and anxious for something to read. He says, after the labors of the day, it is truly gratifying to see them grouped together, reading aloud to each other such portions of their tracts as interest them most, and speaking in the highest praise of the little camp hymn books, right? That would be crazy. That bellflower, people on their free time is reading our little tracks, right? They, they're just having a blast just reading, wow, th this is interesting. And having a blast reading soul stirring songs and hymns. And like, yeah, you know, let's just not even sing, let's just actually just read the lyrics and see what the lyrics say, right? And then, of course, the Bible. Reverend M.D. Anderson, I formed uh, the acquaintance of a noble young man, the nephew of a most useful Baptist minister, found him interested in the reference to his soul and endeavored to explain to him the gospel. He urged me to come again to see him again um, as he was quite sick. When I went again and found him sinking on being asked how he was, he replied, I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him. At my next visit, I found him uh, unstable to speak above a whisper. I stooped down to his ear and inquired how it was with him. And he replied, I had rather depart and be with Christ, which is far better.
And in this delightful frame of mind, he passed to his heavenly home. Right? Um, Brother M.D. Anderson again, I have, in March 12, 1863, I have for some time been aiding in the revival now in progress at Fredericksburg, at which upwards of 60 soldiers have professed conversion. Last night, about 100 asked for the prayers of Christians. A great work is going on, brother. Brother G.C. Trevelyan, Lynchburg, Virginia, we have a soldier reading room here which is well supplied with religious papers. Our hospitals are very thin, much thinned out. I desired, uh, a few days since I was sent for to be with a dying man who desired to see a minister of the gospel, I found him rejoicing in, uh, in a hope of strengthened faith. Our prayer meetings continue with in increasing interest. We have also an interesting Bible class which meets every Sunday morning. Let's see. Ashley, I could go, go ahead and purchase the book or just ask me to borrow it. There's stories after stories after stories after stories after stories of the, 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 the influence that Word of God had. And it's funny, what had more influence on the society was the Word of God. That had much more influence, right? Again, what do we call the South again? The Bible Belt. The, that means what? This has more, much more influence. The Bible and the gospel tracts was more influential than stirring up people to to uh, vote or to to get on a political platform, right? That that's what was more powerful, right? Um, understand, soul winning is more powerful than campaigning for your favorite political party, right? Soul winning is more powerful, right? That's how you're gonna change people's minds. Not telling them that Biden is the way, the truth, and the life, or Trump and the Republican Party or the Democrat Party, or the Libertarian or whatever party is going to be Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. You heard me, all right? So these people could have easily been bashing Abraham Lincoln. I, I, I pro they probably was. One bit, one bit believe, uh, be, uh, behind them. But they could have easily been bashing Abraham Lincoln and charged the soldiers up to take more of a political action outside the military. But they didn't. They chose to go out and spread the word of God, even if that meant jail, even if that meant death. Even if that means they're going to be viewed as American traitors for the rest of their life. Oh, and so what, you want to give gospel tracts to the Confederate armies? The traitors? The rebels? You're a traitor. Traitor to your nation. Gow on you. Right? Shame. James chapter 12, uh, 1 verse 12 says, says, Blessed is the man that endures temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Are you willing to pit your God first? Or are you willing to pit your political favorite politician first? Are you willing to pit the kingdom of heaven before your earthly kingdom? Are you willing to put the word of God that doesn't return void over the constitution that does return void as we, as we saw? Unconstitutional acts was committed right here during this time. Yet the word of God still stood strong. Though Abraham Lincoln ultimately won the war, he did lose some battles, but he lost the most important battle to any of us, which was he lost the battle against the word of God. This man's hand is covered with the blood of southern and northern people and God's people. Yes, Lincoln, he suspended habeas corpus and committed many unconstitutional acts. Therefore, we should be on notice. We should be aware that the Constitution will not stand forever, just like all the other constitutions in the world from Imperial China to Greece and Egypt, all those things, they, they're going to perish, right? They're not going to stand forever. However, we must remember the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of God, the word of our God, shall stand forever. And this story right here on American soil that occurred fairly recently is proof that God's word endureth forever. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ is pardon and forgiveness of sin? How much do you love the eternal and inspired word of God? Are you as hungry for the Bible as were our Confederate ancestors? Is the Bible reading a part of your daily life? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And even Jeremiah confessed, as we as shall be, 
right? Or oh, excuse me, Job, excuse me. 23 verse 12 says, neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his, of his mouth more than my necessary food. Again, like I told y'all, this endures forever. Politicians, you're whatever. I know I may be touching on somebody's, you know, touching on somebody's, you know, crossing that line of, you know, people, because again, we live in a very captivating political uh, environment. I don't care. This is what I care more about. Soul winning influences more lives than any politician, political party. All right. Let's go. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for another day. Thank you for showing us the truth. Thank you for teaching us something. Thank you for showing us not only in this part of history that, you know, people did yearn for the word of God. And thank you for just teaching something that when we look at our fathers of our past, we can understand their hearts and learn something. But most importantly, thank you for showing us that your word endures forever. Lord, be with us for the rest of the service. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.